Bob, thank you so much for being part of our project, Speaking Truth to Youth. I really appreciate it and giving your time today. I just have a few questions that I want to ask you. And we'll start with what events or beliefs in your youth led you to become an activist? I mean, I certainly wasn't an activist as a child. My parents were nice people and they were not prejudiced or anything like that, but they were Republicans and, you know, life was what it was. And I grew up in a very, very, very segregated community, a suburb of Detroit. I think the the thing that opened the the door of astonishment that the world was the way it was, you know, we, they, you know, my parents, especially my mother, was deeply involved in the, in the Lutheran Church, and so we all, you know, we went to church, went to Sunday school. When I was sixteen years old, I wound up reading a book called The Age of Reason by Thomas Paine. But before that, I had read the book Exodus by Leon Uren about, you know, Jews and, and the state of Israel. And it, it had a big, it was very moving to me. You know, I loved the, their story. My religion, they didn't go out of their way about this, but there's kind of quietly there. If you're a non-believer, you went to hell. So all these Jews were going to go to hell. You know, at age 16, I couldn't fathom that, you know, and it seemed so awful, so wrong. And then I read The Age of Reason, which was all about bringing reason to the Bible and pushing, the, you know, a lot of the Bible aside. And I declared myself to not to be an agnostic, not a Christian, because of all that stuff. I I believed all, all of the, you know, love, you know, your enemy and all that stuff that, Christians purported to believe, but the stuff they really believed. And and so that's what opened it up for me, you know, and the activism. And then, you know, so I'm just a teenager and I'm not politically, you know, focused or anything, but the civil rights movement was occurring. And I think that started to open me up. And I'm going to college too. So I'm away from and out of, out of the context of growing up and trying to find myself and there's the civil rights movement knocking on my door. And I go, yeah, absolutely, absolutely, civil rights. So I open myself up to that. And then along comes the Vietnam War. I wasn't immediately, you know, opinionated about it. But eventually that hit me too. Oh, my God, this is terrible. It's wrong. And then I became a very, very serious anti-war activist as, you know, it grew you know, also I became a hippie to just change the world. Civil rights and the anti-war movement both really gripped me by, you know, by the soul. You know, this is how I'm going to live my life is nobody can be, should be denied civil rights and called inferior. And then of course, war is all about creating an enemy that's inferior. You dehumanize an enemy and then you can kill it and no big deal. So those are the two things that very much pushed me into the activism that I found a way to become a part of throughout my life. So as you live right now, um, do you see similarities between now and the 60s? I mean, do I see similarities? Well, certainly I see similarities in the issues that are still there. I mean, I just was looking at, you know, the headline and about Biden now wants this $800 billion military budget. And, oh, for God's sake, when, when, why, how can this stop? How can this end? It just keeps going up. No matter who, what a politician says about being kind of wimpily anti-war, the military budget, it keeps <laughs> going up. It doesn't feel so much like 40 and plus years ago, so much as it feels worse. It feels mostly like it's getting worse and more insane. But I, I'm not totally without a sense of positive energy and hope. The moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice, a la, a la Mr. King. And I think it's important to keep holding on to that. Yeah, this is bigger than something that I can fix like that. But I have to stay connected and the law in the long Hall way beyond what I can see in my own mind. We are moving towards where we must move. That leads me to my very next question is what uh-huh. continues to motivate you or give you courage or guide you? I think one of the things that sort of really hit me and reopened my you know, soul during my adult 
years. I mean, I had become a successful journalist and I was being pulled into the the middle of the roadness of, of mainstream journalism. Then I met my future wife, Barbara, Barbara Grau, who was still, and, and I mean, she was a lawyer, but she was an idealist and still essentially a hippie in her heart. And she pulled me back into where I was in my youth, in, you know, in terms of a, a real big, you know, profound believer that the world has, has to be fair, that war has to stop and all that stuff. I pulled that back into my life. And, and that led me to, and as a journalist, that was my way of, of, of reaching the world was via writing. Basically, it pushed me into becoming a, a columnist. First, first at the, this uh, group of neighborhood papers called Learner Paper, and then, you know, someone later for the Chicago Tribune, not so much for the Tribune as the newspaper, but I, I was an editor at their Tribune syndicate. And, you know, called Tribune, now called Tribune Content Agency. And when I was working there, I was I, I was able to get them to agree to syndicate, you know, let me start writing a column that they also syndicated. And that's been 22 years ago now. Or, and I'm still writing that column that's syndicated by the Tribune. So that's my, my activism. It's 90% is in the writing that I do. And the writing is far too progressive to really have a big home in the mainstream media. It's out there on, on online on a lot of sites and all that. You know, and it does, papers do pick it up from time to time, but not a lot. So it's not an enormously successful column in terms of, you know, having a lot of newspaper clients by any means. But it's there and I have readers and I have enough incentive to keep going. What gives you hope right now? What gives me hope? I... I mean, sometimes it looks like there are, you know, are positive changes occurring. Politically, there's very slow stuff, and it's more combating the, the fascism than it is actually creating what we believe, you know. The hope is very minimally in, in politics. The hope is in other things. The book project that I'm involved in is trying to address some of those other things. One of them is this... Uh, concept called restorative justice. You know, you sit in a circle, everyone talks, you know, and gets a chance to talk, you know, and it's a way of dealing for many things, but also including dealing with when harm has been done. Healing versus punishment. There, There is a movement in, you know, and it's going, and it's worldwide to, you know, to create this kind of change. The weekend I just did was called Path to Spirit, and it was a uh, a weekend about human human becoming. It was difficult. We we dealt with deep issues in our lives, our brokenness, the injuries of our childhood, and all that. You came away with a something, a, a spiritual message. And the spiritual message to me is, uh, I can do the job that God has given me. I'm not going to be afraid of my book. I will do the job that God has given me. It's so easy to give up. I think this weekend helped me find something that can help me get, transcend the, the ease with which I am able to give up, which I've been struggling with for a couple of years now. Creating peace is complicated. Yes. It's so much easier to get an enemy and then let's, let's get rid of that enemy or let's punish or even kill, you know, that's called war. We don't call it murder, we call it war or collateral damage. That's a wonderful term. Uh, restorative yes. justice is, def is definitely part of the complexity that we need to embrace and that the media needs to embrace. The stupidity of mainstream you know, reporters over the decades, it's so much easier to corral people against an enemy. We do really well with um, yes and no. We don't do so well with maybe. Maybe is just so complex because that means listen to that guy too and that person and all of a sudden and kind of look at me. Oh, come on. Let's just do yes and no. <laughs> what advice do you have for, for youth activists today? I mean, basically, I would say my advice begins with think for yourself. It's your life. When something feels wrong out there in, in the larger lesson being taught for you, you have a right to challenge that. 
So I would say it definitely starts with that. Think for yourself, you know, and then I would say we're all evolving, you know, not just physically, but socially. And and I think spiritually, evolution is participatory. And that means you, maybe you're only 14 years old, or maybe you're only 19, whatever, you are a part of it. And who you are, your gifts must, you know, need to be part of the process of evolving toward the world that we want, the fair, just, and sustainable world that everyone wants. You don't have to say, okay, I'm here, I'm going to sit on the sidelines, and maybe they'll find something. You know, that's all part of it, too. We have to, you know, be able to sit and listen to others, but also know you are deeply and truly a part of the process. So think for yourself and know that you are and your gifts and your genius is needed. Thank you so much, Bob, for taking time to talk today. I've really enjoyed our conversation. And Absolutely. Same here.